I was born in 1966 in Beirut, Lebanon, to a Palestinian father and a Lebanese mother. Uh, my father was uh, uh, born in Gaza and uh, after Israel occupied the land, uh, he uh, enrolled in the resistance against Israel and uh, started carrying operations from Jordan. And so he got in trouble with the Jordanian government and he had to leave Jordan and go to Lebanon and there he met my mother and they got married and then he left before I was born. Uh, my mom uh, had to work day and night so in practically speaking I was a street kid. Uh, I was always on the streets and I would just come home to sleep. Uh, in the neighborhood where I was, there was an evangelical church and the uh, teachers of Sunday school in that church used to go around the streets and call children to come in and uh, attend Sunday school. Uh, so I was one of the guys they invited and for a street kid, uh, he's always looking for attention. So. Uh, I uh, accepted the invitation and came in and Sunday school turned out to be a nice place for me because there they tell you stories, you can color, they give you toys, you can eat cake and have juice and it's, it's a good place for a street kid to have a, a good time. And so since I was six I remember attending Sunday school regularly every Sunday. Uh, it was, uh, it's like going to church uh, for uh, any uh, churchgoer. Uh, to me, Sunday morning was sacred. I need to go to Sunday school. There I have a good time. And uh, uh, this was going on until I was 14 years old. At the age of 14, I was ready to meet my Savior. Now, uh, two years before that, questions were starting to arise about where is God? Who is God? Why I am a Muslim? Where is my father? Uh, you have to understand the background that I was living in. I was living next to the American University of Beirut at a time when there, are, there were revolutions going everywhere, communism rising, uh, the Cold War was at its peak. Uh, already uh, there was an Israeli-Arab uh, conflict in 1973. A peace was looming in the, uh, in the, on the horizon. People were talking, students were talking. It was really a time where uh, easily you can mature on the streets, being on the street. And uh, mingling with the uh, uh, university student made me really mature quickly. And at the age of 12, yes, I was asking critical questions. At that age, uh, I turned to Islam being a Muslim. And especially my family, uh, you know, on my mother's side, uh, they are all uh, scholars, Islamic scholars. So uh, I started reading the Quran, I started taking Quranic lessons in order to find uh, certain answers to questions I had. Uh, but to no avail. Nothing was there for me. I didn't find hope. I was more confused more. Uh, there were a lot of contradictions that I could not accept. And uh, also remember, I was free to think. I was not under any influence of a father or a mother to tell me, don't think like this, or this is not right what you're talking about. I was a free thinker. I could ask questions, I could doubt, and I had no problem. And so it was at that time, also I was going to church and attending Sunday school. And uh, at the age of 14, after hearing the gospel for six years and more, uh, it just things clicked. I found the truth as if the Lord opened my eyes to see my uh, state 
exactly and to give me answers to why I am like this, why I was like this, why did my father leave me, why there are wars around, why is the world the way it is. And I realized it is uh, my sinfulness, my parents' sinfulness, uh, the world around us uh, that brings misery and suffering to people. And uh, it was Christ who is the answer. It's that message of love that God has unfolded through the pages of history to us. And so I remember on a Sunday in 1979, the Sunday school teacher asking us in Sunday school class, who wants to accept Jesus as his personal savior? And I felt like raising my hand, but there were too many friends of mine who were Muslim. Uh, and I didn't want to, you know, risk it. And I said, no, I'm not going to do it now. But uh, deep down, I was there. This is it. I could not resist anymore. And I went home and I could not sleep that night. And I would fidget in my bed. And my bed was a bag of cloth, plastic bag of cloth. And every time I move, I make all kinds of sounds. And my, I was afraid to wake up my mom. We all slept in one room. And uh, around 3 o'clock, I remember, in the morning, I just said, Lord Jesus, please help me. I am desperate. I am helpless. I am hopeless. I cannot take it anymore. I need you. And with tears at that time, and then within half an hour, I slept. And I woke up in the morning excited, and I took one of the many New Testaments I had. I mean, after eight years of attending Sunday school, you gather, collect a lot of New Testaments. I took one and put it in my school bag and went to school and started telling people about my experience. And I could not be quiet. It was Jesus all the way. I mean, on the street, in school, at work, in the house, Jesus, Jesus, and People were saying, did this, this guy flip or something happened to him? Did he fall from his bed at night? Or uh, Everybody was wondering why this was happening. I was on fire at that time. And uh, I couldn't be quiet. I had to talk. I had to tell people what happened with me. The change. Uh, uh, I think, uh, and I can understand people, children who raised in Christian homes and churches, uh, and wherever I go and speak today, I tell them, please do not miss out on meeting the real Jesus. Not that the one that your papa and mama told you about. Uh, have the experience I had. You know, it's it just, just life changing. It was uh, a time where beyond comprehension what was happening in my life. Uh, there was uh, joy overflowing. I felt at rest, I felt at peace. Uh, all the answers came to the questions that made my life a dilemma and were traumatizing me. Because being raised without a father is traumatizing to you. And if, if you don't find the answer why this happened in God, you cannot understand. And I understood why, because God wanted to save me. Because God had a plan. Everything worked for good. Uh, uh, eternal good, not earthly good. And while I was lost in my livelihood that it's not good and I had no father, God was really interested in my eternal good. And the joy that I experienced in meeting Jesus was much greater than having a father at that time. And so from there on, it was Jesus all the time. And that got me in trouble. Uh, definitely speaking on and on uh, got me in trouble with my parents. They had to kick me out and say, it's either the church or the house. It's either Christ or us. And uh, I was so in love with Jesus, uh, I didn't have difficulty making choice. Uh, it was Jesus all the time. And I had to leave the house and go live in a warehouse where I used to work. Uh, the owner of the warehouse knew about what happened, and he said, Mohammed, you can empty a room, uh, pack it in another room, and take one room and fix it and sleep in it as long as you want. 
And uh, later I got in trouble with fundamentalists because I was always speaking about Jesus. And who's this Muhammad that is uh, preaching about Jesus, that's evangelizing about Jesus? And uh, they were after my tail. Uh, they tried to kill me one time. Uh, they had no success. Uh, my pastor had to take me to his village. Uh, he was from a village in a Biblos area. It's called Munsif. And he would put me in a boarding school there for six months to hide me. And then uh, after that, I came back. And still, I went back to talking. And I couldn't be quiet. And he'd tell me, be quiet. And I cannot be quiet. Everywhere I go, uh, the opportunity is there. I tell people about Jesus. Uh, I invite people to church. I start ministering to children. And uh, until 1985, towards the end of 1985, uh, I was in the evangelical school in Beirut and there was a teacher there. He was a member of our church and together we used to go out street evangelism and they killed him and the pastor said, you're next. I'm not going to allow this. So he made connections uh, with uh, friends of his in, in the States uh, in Bob Jones University in Greenville, South Carolina. And he said, I have a guy, his life is in danger, I need to ship him out. Arrange for him something. And they arranged for me to come and attend a Bible school. And so in 1986, I flew to the U.S. I remember I came uh, through Heathrow Airport. I flew to London first. And uh, then from London, I flew to Philadelphia, and Philadelphia down to Greenville Spartanburg. That was the trip. The first time in the United States of America it was in 1986. To uh, uh, pursue a biblical career, you know, to study Bible and maybe to be, uh, carry on pastoral studies or uh, biblical uh, theology. Uh, but when I uh, started my first semester, uh, I got all A's. And uh, I thought that was too easy for me. Uh, and that's because early on, uh, I was devouring the Bible. I mean, I was reading my wor God's Word on a daily basis, listening to messages. I was heavily involved in studying the Word of God. I'm reading books, a lot of books. And so I switched into business. And uh, I pursued an accounting degree. And uh, in 1989, I took a BS in accounting. And uh, before my last semester, I was offered a job uh, by Arthur Anderson to work in New York. And then another job by Pricewaterhouse to go to Cairo, since I knew Arabic. But uh, somehow the Lord uh, did not let me take these offers and did not let me stay uh, in the US. Uh, I felt. I need to go back. I don't know why I felt I need to go back. Uh, at times, God uh, leads in, a, in an awesome way, though everything here was ready for me to stay. I mean, uh, there was a girl I, I was in love with. I could have gotten married to her and stayed. Uh, I could have taken these job offers. But somehow, I went back. And when I went back in 1989, it was war in Lebanon. Everything was going berserk and uh, the airport was closed I had to fly to Cyprus and from Cyprus take the ship to Juni and from Juni drive to West Beirut and I came and I found the church four or five people were meeting and mainly ladies and there was nothing going on no church meetings barely anything happening so Muhammad went back to his old days preaching evangelizing visiting ministering to people and within a year the church regrouped and people were starting to come and things were moving up in the world and uh, the church grew by 1991 100 people were attending and uh, including uh, my mother-in-law and my wife they came to the church uh, to attend and uh, I remember meeting my wife on the basketball court and, uh, in 1985, and uh, we played hoop together. 
I used to go down to the American University of Beirut. She used to live on the campus of the American University of Beirut. Her father was power plant manager. And as we were playing together, I would always talk to her about Jesus. And she said, you're crazy with your Jesus. I don't want to talk to you. Leave me alone. And I was always evangelizing to her. And then in 1991, she comes to church and with her mom. And her mom invites her. She came before her a few meetings. And she says, come here, this guy. His name is Muhammad, and he's preaching about Christ. And he's leading the church. And she came and she says, I know this guy. He was always bothering me with Jesus when I was playing basketball. And uh, a relationship developed there. And uh, she got saved, I think, uh, four months after started attending church. And then we dated for a year. And then we got married. Uh, the pastor came back at that time. And I handed the church over to him. And I went into business. Uh, being raised as a street kid and poor, there was always a desire in me to achieve, to prove myself. There was ambition. And uh, I wanted to pursue that dream. And I was trying to convince God of that dream. God, since the day he saved me, he called me into the ministry. I knew that. He gave me the talent. He gave me the burden. Uh, he gave me the vision to reaching out to people. But I refused to answer God's call. I wanted to do it my way. I said, I'll be a businessman and I will support the church and I will give to the poor and I will help missionaries. And uh, in fact, in my early years in business, uh, at the age of 25, I had close to a half a million dollars between assets and cash and everything. And I had my own factory and store and I owned my own house in a good place in East Beirut and uh, things were rolling for me and I was giving to people I was helping people uh, I mean uh, there were times a thousand dollar a month I would give out to people between church and helping people uh, and I was trying to convince God that this is the way and God was always telling me I don't need your money I don't need your intelligence I don't need anything that you have I need you to obey. Give me your heart. And that was difficult for me because there was a struggle. And I was in love with business and I was in love with Jesus. Uh, there was a conflict there and there was a struggle all the time in my life. Uh, and uh, God was patient with me. Until 1995, he got the big stick out. He says, I love you too much and I have plans for you, I'm not ready to leave you alone. So he got the big stick out, and I took a beating, big beating. And within years, few years, I lost everything. I was stripped naked, uh, I was in debt, uh, I went to prison because I went bankrupt, uh, I was facing many lawsuits, I had all kinds of problems going on. And uh, after I went to prison for six months, I came out, and instead of answering God's call and repenting and saying, Lord, that's what I want to do, uh, is what you want me to do, I went back to business. I was hard-headed uh, as an ox. And uh, again, God gave me the talent. Uh, in a few years, I made money again. And I was paying some of my debts and at the same time building a business. And it was growing and we were doing fine. Until 2008, uh, one day I was taking my children to school. I dropped them at school. And I used to go down jogging at the beach in Beirut. And as I was jogging, it just clicked again. The same feelings, the same uh, uh, situation I was in in 1979 when I got saved, I was back again in in 2008. I felt how stupid I am, how foolish I am to relinquish serving the Lord for the world and for the profit that I can get from the world and the gains of this world. And I said, this is it. Finish. No more business. I went up to my wife and I said, honey, close shop liquidate everything at a gain, at a loss, that's it, it's over. She said, what, did you flip? Are you crazy? 
We have five children. What do you mean closed shop? How are we going to raise our children? How are we going to live? We have no income. I said, the Lord will provide. Just close it. She said, no, I'm not going to close it. I said, then you'll take care of it. I am not going to be in the shops. I'm not going to work one hour in the shops. I will be on the streets telling people about Jesus. This is what God wants me to do. That's what I'm going to do. And uh, I went out. And she started liquidating a little bit. She liquidated until she had, we had only one shop. And that's the bookstore. And she stayed in it. And I was ministering on the streets and uh, doing street evangelism in Tripoli, in Beirut, in Juni, in Biblos. And God led us down to Tyre one day. And we went down to Tyre to evangelize. Uh, and uh, I fell in love with the place. Uh, and, you know, Jesus was here 2,000 years ago. He came to Tyre. Paul the Apostle was here. Uh, this is the land of the gospel. You know, Upper Galilee, this is where Jesus was going around and telling people about Jesus. And there is no lighthouse. It's dead. 95% uh, Muslims. No light. Total darkness. And I found the Lord telling me, go reclaim the land. The devil, through uh, Islam, has controlled the whole area. Uh, and uh, we're there uh, to shine for Jesus and to release people from this bondage that they are in. And so, yes, we are in the devil's den, preaching Christ. Uh, when you are in a 95% Muslim area, where is the light there? There is no light. Uh, and uh, that's what God has called us for. And I think uh, in the last 50 to 60 years, meager efforts have been taken to reach the Muslim world to Christ. And I can understand why. Because people are Islamophobic. Uh, Islam is violent. It promotes violence. Uh, on different levels. It depends on the circumstance and what's around it. Uh, and uh, people are afraid. Uh, but I do think that we have a weapon that is much greater than violence and can overcome violence. And that is love. Most of the times we either want to love and not in, in, in sincerity, or we want to say the truth and not love. Uh, I do believe that in evangelism, love and truth go together. If you love people without any reservation, unconditionally, sacrificially, you will be able to stand and say the truth to them. They will accept it from you because they know that you love them. If you don't love them and you want to say the truth, they're not going to accept it from you because they think you are a hypocrite. You're saying something and you're acting differently. Uh, what we do entire today is we love on people. Uh, we sacrifice. They see that we go not one mile, but three miles. They know that we love them. And so we can stand and say to them, we do not agree with you. We don't believe what you believe in is right. And that is why. And uh, there is a risk of us getting hurt. Yes. But who said that preaching the gospel is without a cost? Uh, Jesus said, in the world you shall have tribulation." But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So this was 
a prophetic statement by Jesus. He, before we even went out, he told us we're going to have problems. But he also told us that we're going to be victorious. We're serving in Tyre, and we know we're going to have the victory. It has been given unto you not only to believe, but also to suffer. If any man would come after me, let him take up his cross, deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So it's clear in the Bible that when you evangelize, when you tell people about Jesus, you're going to suffer. Now, if God's grace does not permit that for a reason or another, that's good. My wife and I went down to Tyre, and we counted the cost. She knew that we could die, and I knew that we could die, and we both knew that our children could be in jeopardy. But we also knew that the God who called us and the God who sent us he will take care of us. He will protect us. And if the time comes and we have to be offered up for him to be glorified, then we had no problem with that. That was the mindset that we went down to Tyre with. Uh, there were times uh, they put me in prison because I clearly declared that Islam and Christianity are not the same. And they don't lead to the same God. And if you understand anything about Lebanon, this is a no-no, because you're rocking the boat. Everybody wants to live happy with each other in Lebanon. And I stood on public TV in front of six million people, and I said, Islam is as far from Christianity as hell is far from heaven. And that was enough to put me in prison. They made a scheme about my past, and they rolled me in. But I knew that. That was a cost I would pay. Uh, before that, they attacked our van, they hit my wife, they broke the glass of my, our van as my wife was taking back children from Sunday school. So the cost is there. Uh, a few days ago, they broke our signs in, 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 in Tyre because one Muslim guy was converted and he openly and publicly declared that I'm a Christian. So to me, persecution is part of the game. And uh, any Christian who thinks he can avoid persecution, I think that is not possible. As you, we've said before, we are in the devil's den. You're attacking the fortress of the devil. The devil is not going to kiss you if you attack him. He's going to attack back. He's not stupid. He's smart. He knows that he cannot be uh, sitting and looking at you. And any time you try to avoid persecution, uh, you have to do it on the expense of the gospel. You will compromise your stand in order to avoid persecution. And I don't want to compromise my stand. I don't want to compromise the gospel to avoid persecution. Many people under the pretext of wisdom say, you know, you have to be wise. I don't know how wise you can be. Uh, I don't think we can be more wise than Jesus Christ. Uh, he came, and he had to be persecuted, and he had to die. And there was no other way. And for the gospel to spread out, and for people to know the truth, we have to die, too. Uh, for the Muslim people to know Christ, we have to die. There has to be a line of martyrs, I think, in the future, before these people understand that there is a God that loves them. If we're not ready to pay that cost, I don't think anything is going to happen. Sometime we have to pay that cost. And I think for the hundred years that passed, we're postponing the payment. But Christianity was spread in the first century church by the blood of the martyrs. People died. That's how Christianity was spread. That's how we conquered Today, in order to conquer, we have to be ready to die. Uh, people ask me in churches, what makes a good missionary? And my answer is always, are you ready to die? If you're not ready to die, pack it and go home. Don't be a missionary. Stay where you are. You have to be ready to die to be a missionary. And I think this was the life uh, theme of 
every missionary, successful missionary, they were ready to die for Jesus. And so uh, my desire is uh, to see the church wake up and stop being complacent and uh, uh, realize that today it's open doors in the Middle East. Opposite of what CNN tells you on Fox News. Uh, they are uh, focusing on a uh, few Americans being killed as if uh, this is the end of the world to them. Uh, and we categorize sin and we say, oh, wow, that's bad what's happening with ISIS in, in the Middle East. Uh, but I want to ask a simple question. Every single day in abortion clinics, you take babies and throw them in the dumpster. These are not humans. They're not dying. What's the difference between a lady that takes a baby and throws him in the dumpster and an ISIS man who beheads a man? In fact, what did this infant have of a choice? He had no choice. You killed him. The guys who died in, in, in Syria or beheaded, they had a choice not to go. They chose to take that adventure, and that was the price for their adventure. And so we categorize sin in order to excuse ourselves. It's bad in the Middle East. We can't go there because they kill people. They kill people in America. These people, they need us. They need us to love them. And love is intentional. It's not natural. It's not in our nature to love. We're selfish. We have to intend to love. We have to seek a way to penetrate into their societies and love them. Just like what we're doing in Tyre. We take every opportunity to show love. Every opportunity. And nobody knocks our door and gets out with nothing. Always they'll have something. Uh, because this is love. Even sometimes at the expense of us getting a loan to help people. I remember uh, three months ago, I had a young man come to me. He's a Muslim, and he said, uh, Mr. Muhammad, my wife is in the hospital, and I need $200 to get her out. Would you help me? I said, no problem. I went to the hospital, paid the bill. He got his wife out. Two days later, he comes to me, he says, Mr. Muhammad, do you have a big cross? I said, Hassan, why do you need a big cross? He says, I want to hang it on my neck. And I want to tell my people that the God of the Christians helped me and your God did not help me. This gives God glory. You see, this is why we're there. To glorify God. To honor Him and lift Him up. That's why we're there. That's why we are in the world. To go the extra mile. Uh, I think people are tired of us telling them Jesus loves you. They want to See how Jesus loves me. Show me how Jesus loves me. You know? Uh, I want to see how. And I think we are very good at speaking the truth, but not applying it. Uh, and uh, we don't want to apply it. We think that it's enough to tell people the gospel. But that's not true. Because this is not what Jesus did. I remember the disciples, after Jesus finishing his intercourse with the multitude, uh, they said, okay, chief, let's pack it, send them home. And Jesus said, send them where home? These people are hungry, they want to eat. But you told them the message, you told them the gospel, why should we feed them? Let them go home. And, and we're like the disciples today, we like to send people home. We don't want to get into the trouble of feeding them and taking care of them and worrying about them. Uh, we're too busy, uh, we are so entangled with the affairs of this world that we have no time to love anymore. We need to make time to love. We need to start realizing 
why Jesus left us on this earth. The reason we exist as Christians on this earth is to shine. You are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they might see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We are a people of good works. That's why we're here. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's Paul. This is from the Bible. I'm not making up this. The reason we are here is to live for Christ, regardless of what is our profession. As a doctor, I am here to live for Christ. As a pastor, I am here to live for Christ. As a businessman, I am here to live for Christ. In my profession, Christ has to be glorified and declared. That's why I am here. I'm not here to accumulate wealth. I'm not here to earn degrees. I'm not here to do any of these things. Today in the Middle East, it's open doors. The Muslim world is in despair. The brothers are killing each other. Young people are helpless and hopeless. They are looking for an alternative. The alternative is not there because we are afraid. We need to start bringing the alternative home to them. We need to go. We need to start invading the Middle East with love, not with cruise missiles. We need to erect lighthouses for Jesus Christ. And that's what I am in. We started in Tyre. Now we're moving to Jordan. And to every place we can, we are going to erect a lighthouse for Jesus Christ. A door for people to enter in and know the love of God. That's my vision for the Middle East. And that vision I wanted to share with churches in America today. I, I say to the churches in America, stop being complacent. Rise up to the challenge that God has placed in front of you today. Today it's open doors. Revelation chapter 3, verse 8. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no man will shut. And it's interesting that God set open doors in front of the church of Philadelphia. The word Philadelphia means brotherly love. It takes love to take advantage of open doors. No love, no open doors. I call on all brothers in America and churches to love the Muslims everywhere. Not to argue with them. Not to do apologetics or go into Islamics or try to find... Com there is nothing common between us and them except that we are human. And we have to get that message across to them. The thing that is common between us and any other person is that we are humans. We do not have the same faith and we do not lead to the same God. Our God is a living God, is a holy God, is a righteous God who loves all people. That's the message that we can get across. Uh, uh, Christianity has the, is the religion that has a message that no other religions have. Our message is love. Love unfolding from Genesis to Revelation. It's the story of love. How God loved man and work throughout history to redeem man and how he's going to glorify man in eternity. It's a story of love. And that message, no other religion in the world has that message. What we find in other religions is do's and don'ts. We do not find love. And people cannot understand and comprehend love. People cannot understand that God in human design came to earth to love us. They cannot comprehend that. And I, I, I can understand why. But this is why we're here. To tell them that this is real. 
And the best thing to tell people that this is real is what God has done in your life. And to live that story. And so, my desire is that we see the urgency of the times. These people in the Middle East are calling us. God uses the suffering of people and pain. He opens doors through suffering and pain so we can enter their lives. Today, the Syrian crisis has resulted in millions of refugees. In Lebanon, we have two and a half million refugees. And God is opening doors through them and with them. We're seeing hundreds of them come to church and hear the gospel and get saved. What we need is laborers. We need laborers. We need people to support the work. We need people to stand by us in prayer. Uh, uh, containing Islam is not in the backyard in Chicago. Containing Islam is at the front line in the Middle East. That's how we contain the antagonism and the violence and the hatred that's there. We have to go there uh, at the expense of our lives sometimes. But God is good. I, I'm serving there and uh, it's six years now. And before that, I used to evangelize, and God has protected me. I am 49 years old. I don't know when the Lord will call me home. But whenever he does, he knows what he's doing. And I want to be obedient to that. But I know also that before God calls me home, nothing is going to happen. I know that he has a hedge of protection around me and my family. And at any time something happens, it's for his glory. I know there is something for him to be glorified in. And for God to get the glory, I want to evangelize. Uh, I do believe that God is glor most glorified when we most evangelize. I think we've missed out on that. God is most glorified when we most evangelize. Not when we build mega churches. Not when we have beautiful concerts. But when we evangelize, we go out and tell people about that great message of love that no other religion in the world has that could change and transform your life and makes you a new person and brings life into your life, wakes you up from the dead. And so I pray that this message will be heard and people will wake up to what is there. Thank you.